have named an unchanged 15 for Saturday's Rugby World Cup final against South Africa. Well, there's one change to the Springboks team. Cheslin Colby returns on the right wing, having recovered from an ankle injury. For OTB Sports Radio, I'm Tom Malone. OTB Sports Radio. The Rugby World Cup on OTB Sports Radio. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. Rugby World Cup on Off The Ball. Updates, analysis and opinion across all OTB channels from start to finish. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB Sports Radio. All right, welcome along. You're listening to the Off The Ball Rugby World Cup show with me, Neil Tracy. Less than 48 hours to go now until we know the winner of the 2019 Rugby World Cup. Uh, England and South Africa have named their teams for Saturday morning's final in Yokohama uh, ahead of the decider uh, there on Saturday morning. We'll look at those teams in detail as well. We'll also be previewing the game in 1995 World Cup winner with South Africa, Kobus Visa, and we'll check in with Alan Quinlan live in Japan also. Let me know what you think. Leave a comment on one of our streams. We are all over the place on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. You can also listen to us on offtheball.com or on OTB Sports Radio, which you can get uh, through the Go Loud app. And a reminder as well that all of our rugby coverage here on Off The Ball is brought to you by Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. First though, your latest Rugby World Cup news, as I said, the team news is in. England and South Africa have both shown their hands ahead of this Saturday's final in Yokohama. No changes for England. They've gone with the same 15 that started that brilliant win against New Zealand last week. The only change to the match day 23 sees Ben Spencer come in for Will Hines. An incredible week for Spencer. Only actually called in uh, to the squad last Saturday after Hines had picked up an injury. And now the scrum half, uh, the Saracen scrum half, finds himself on the verge of playing in a world World Cup final. In full, England go with their now usual front row of Mac Vunapola, Jamie George and Kyle Sinkler. Courtney Laws gets the nod once again over George Cruz to partner Maro Atoji in the second row. And in the back row, the Kamikaze brothers, Sam Underhill and Tom Curry, they're either side of Billy Vunapola. Uh, ben Youngs starts at scrum half. He's the most experienced starter in that England team, earning his 95th cap this weekend. George Ford also starts. Eddie Jones has resisted temptation to, to go with Ford off the bench as he did against Australia in the quarterfinals. Owen Farrell then is at 12, Manu Tuolangi at 13. The wings are Johnny May and Anthony Watson. Elliot Daly is at fullback, while uh, the bench, as usual, uh, or the finishers, as Eddie Jones likes to call them, Luke Cowan Dickey, Joe Marler, Dan Cole, George Cruz, Mark Wilson, Ben Spencer, Henry Slade and Jonathan Joseph completing the side. The Springboks, they have made a change, and it's the one we did anticipate. Cheslin Colby has recovered from his ankle injury to start on the wing. That means uh, Sabu Nicosi drops out from the squad entirely. Uh, that's owing to Razi Erasmus taking a 6-2 split on the bench, six forwards and just two backs on his subs bench. There are almost 700 caps in that starting 15, 694 to be exact. C.A. Khaleesi captains them for the 20th time. Uh, he'll be bringing up a half century of caps on Saturday. So at fullback, Vili LaRue earning his uh, 61st cap on the wings. Makazoli Mapimbi and Cheslin Colby with uh, Damien De Allende and Lucanio Am in the centre. Faf de Klerk and Andre Pollard, as usual, in the halfbacks. And then in the forwards, uh, you've got Tendayam Taria, the Beast, Bongi and Manambi and Franz Malherbe in the front row, Ibn Etzebeth and Lou Diager in the second row with Sia Khaleesi, Peter Steftutot and uh, Dwayne Vermeulen finishing off the uh, starting team. While on the bench, Malcolm Marks, Stephen Kitchoff, Vincent Koch, Orgy Snyman, uh, Franco Mostert, Francois Lou, uh, Herschel Yankees and Franz and, uh, Stein, who uh, was part of the 2007 team. 12 years on, he could be earning a second World Cup medal and uh, probably playing in a second World Cup final. He is on the bench this weekend completing that side. Uh, worth noting as well, the team news did also come in yesterday for the third place playoff between Wales and New Zealand, which is taking place tomorrow morning. Uh, granted, third place playoffs always feel a bit of an anti-climax, uh, but it is a final game in charge for both Warren Gatland and Steve Hansen. So what a way it would be for Warren Gatland to buy out with a win and a first Welsh win against the All Blacks since 1953. He's made a lot of changes, though, you would strongly be fancying the All Blacks in this because they have not changed their team too much. Wales, though, nine changes, as I say. They start in full. Uh, a forward pack of Nicky Smith, Ken Owens, Dylan Lewis, Adam Beard, Alan jones in the second row with Justin Tipperick, James Davies and Ross Moriarty completing the pack. While the back line, Thomas Williams and Reese Patchell in the halfbacks, Josh Adams and Owen Lane on the wings. Lane was a, a late call-up into the squad 
uh, while Jonathan Davies and Owen Watkin are in the centre with Hallam Amos at full back. New Zealand, it's a pretty strong starting 15 from them. Joe Moody, Dane Coles, Nepo Laulala, Brody Redelick, Scott Barrett, Shannon Frizzell, Sam Kane, and Kieran Reid in the forwards, while in the back line. Aaron Smith, Richie Mwanga at 10, uh, Rico Ioane and Ben Smith come into the wings. Rico Ioane has been a, a bit of a passenger at this tournament so far, where had, you know, hasn't been getting into that first team with, um, with uh, George Bridge and Seva Reese taking up those wing places. Bowden Barrett then at 15 with Ryan Crotty and Sonny Bill Williams in the centres. Um, and uh, I think we're going to get Cobus Fisa now on the line in just a, a moment or so. Uh, 2007, first though, we're just going to uh, play a little clip of 2007 World Cup winner at the Springboks, Bobby Skinstad, who was on the show the other night, and he was speaking to Richie, and he believes England are coming in as strong favourites, but it's exactly what South Africa want. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what, what you know, any, any red-blooded male in South Africa would do, and I'm going to tell you that this is the kind of game that this team were hoping for. You know, one where the overwhelming odds will be in England's favour and that the only way that they can win is to throw absolutely everything at it and to put their bodies on the line because I know that they're the kind of team that can. The reason that I, that I think they could out in this is that because if this team, if all they ever did was make it all this way to a World Cup final, um, they'd still be heroes in all of our eyes. So so for them to take the next step up is a, is a leap that they can decide to take. And when they decide to take that as a team, then, you know, Goodness help the people in front of them. And, and I think Sia Khaleesi is leading a, a bunch of men like that. So I'm delighted. I think South Africa can take this. Yeah, that was uh, Bobby Skinstad speaking to uh, Richie the other night on Off the Ball. Now we are heading down to South Africa as well. Delighted to be joined by a 1995 World Cup winner with the Springboks, Kobus Fisa. Kobus, thanks for taking our call this afternoon. Anytime, man. Good to talk to you. What are the excitement uh, levels now? Just two days out from the World Cup final, is how's everybody feeling down there heading into the weekend? I don't know. Did you hear Bobby Skinstead speaking just there, talking about how England definitely favourites, but South Africa are probably more than happy coming into the into the game under the radar ever so slightly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't want to be the, the favourite or the so-called favourite uh, amongst the public and the media in any World Cup final because it takes a bit of pressure off you. Uh, there is no doubt, I, I agree with Bob, that uh, England is, and rightfully so, the favourite. They've been playing really outstanding rugby. They've been playing impressive rugby. And they've been building and seem to have been catching on to the best form at the right moment, the way they they ran over Australia. And more impressive, the way they changed gears and upped their game and absolutely uh, swept New Zealand, the current world champions, out of the way. And, and may I say with respect that I, I thought the score flattered New Zealand, it should have been higher, was very impressive. It's a very different dynamic to when these sides met 12 years ago in the final, and it's it's kind of neatly bookending the New Zealand dominance that you've England and South Africa in the final again. But back in 2007, the Springboks were, they were very much the team to beat that year. They were They were very much the team to beat England, do appear to be the favourites, and as you were saying there, rightly so as well. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, I think, you know, uh, it has been mentioned they were dealt in the same group as New Zealand and they had to be a loser there. And on the day, New Zealand obviously deserved to be top of the group. But I think South Africa has got a major... Uh, advantage. They've got probably the best tackle forwards uh, currently in the world. Uh, and more important, the guys coming from the bench, that's why Rossi is picking six forwards on the bench, is equally or sometimes even better. Um, so that's a huge trump card. Uh, if you can dominate up front, uh, I know the backs don't want to admit this all the time, but if you don't have a pack of forwards that can dominate and give you a proper ball, doesn't matter what kind of back line you have, you'll be in, a, in an uphill battle. So South Africa's got massive forwards, great guys coming from the bench, but so does England. Uh, and England's got great backs as well that uh, that can spread the ball wide, that there was massive confidence at this stage, uh, which will count in their favour. And given the strength of those two packs of forwards, would it kind of lead you to think that, you know, if South Africa are to win this weekend, it's probably not going to be the prettiest game of rugby we've ever seen? Yeah, I don't think so, you know. But if you think about finals, uh, the past World Cup finals, very few of them have been spectacular. Uh, yeah. 15 man rugby, like uh, the 74 Lions played, for instance, or the Welsh are known for throwing the ball around. And, uh, in the end, the guys... You know, the, the old story goes around in the pub saying they're not going to ask who played the most beautiful rugby but didn't win the cup or who won the cup, bottom line. So, yeah, in, in a final, you get one chance. It's on the day. Uh, and uh, it's about who's going to lift the cup. You, you, you're very, very right. But you, 
also right, it's two contrasting styles of play that brought both these teams to the final. Yeah, and as you say, like, you know, people are only really going to remember who does win the final. And I think to, to highlight that, the two times South Africa have won the World Cup in those two finals, they're yet to actually score a try in a World Cup final, but they've had the, the Webb Ellis Cup twice in their hands. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure keeping that in the back of his mind, Eddie Jones will say the same to his team. There's no point in us playing the most beautiful, well-structured rugby. We still wouldn't need to win the final. They also say this very funny and cheek thing is that, uh, you know, you do all the hard work getting to a, a World Cup final and then losing it is like kissing your own sister. It's a kiss, but who the hell wants it? <laughs> exactly, yeah. So if South Africa are to win this game, do they have to make it a bit ugly? Do they have to, to kind of drag England into a forward dominated game a lot of rocks a lot of uh, a lot of malls a lot of set pieces to just kind of slow them down yeah i think you're dead right on that i mean every coach will will have his team play towards their strengths south africa has a pack of forwards and they pull out and fuck the clack and keep the ball in front of those forwards that's where they're going to play i don't think they're going to change much uh, and i don't think england's going to change much because they play a more expansive game they can't front up so I think both coaches are going to play uh, to their strengths. And they'll be fools not to. It, it'll boil down probably to the, the team that makes the least mistakes in this final and the team that uses those one or two or maybe three opportunities they get to put it into points. And that could very well be the difference. Mm. Obviously, South Africa will be delighted to be in the final. Is there any reservation at all in South Africa maybe about the style of rugby that they're playing or is this something that... South African fans are used to where it's a it's a forward dominated game, and you know it, it's like the old cliche: the forwards you know win the match, the the backs decide by how much. Is there is there any real reservation, or are you just happy to kind of be there compared to where South Africa were a couple of years ago? I don't think a lot of people would have anticipated a World Cup final. So is it a case that they're just kind of they're happy to be back amongst the big players? I think it's a bit of both, though. I think people are very happy and feel that we are very happy that they've got to the final uh, not coming to this World Cup as the utmost favourite I would I would have would like to say that Ireland came to uh, the World Cup is number one ranked in the world there's New Zealand there's England there's always been a, a, a firm favourite uh, but, uh, but South Africa would be happy that they're in the final but Rossi is also a clever coach he'll tell the team now that's in the past you know, there's no point in getting to the final, as I said earlier, and not winning this thing. So there's huge expectation. There's always massive expectation in this country. doesn't matter if we think we have a good team this year or not. I mean, rugby is as in New Zealand and in Ireland and Wales and all these rugby-loving countries. I mean, rugby is a religion like all other sports, and rightfully so. And people are extremely demanding and passionate, and again, rightfully so. Uh, so it sets the tone. It sets the mood. And this whole week, there's going to be barbecues from morning till night. And uh, unfortunately, a couple of lambs will will uh, will bite the brunt because they'll end up somewhere uh, <laughs> on a plate and a few pints. But it's massive excitement in this country. There's no doubt about it. As I'm sure there is in the UK and more specifically in England because those two countries are playing in the final for this unbelievable trophy called the Webb Ellis Trophy. Yeah, and on that atmosphere, as you mentioned there, the excitement, uh, we have a, mes a message in here from Rich who says, what is the atmosphere like in South Africa at the moment, Cobus, for this final, well, com compared to 1995 it, and 2007? Well, it's massive. It, it's, it, it is huge excitement. People are, are, are not getting much work done this week. They, uh, they are really uh, have this huge expectation from, the, from their side, very positive thinking and and, and huge support, uh, like it is in front of any uh, test match, and, and more so in the World Cup final. So, but I think people are also not arrogant. They do realise and acknowledge that England has got a massive side. They are playing brilliant rugby, and one should acknowledge that. Uh, and, and I think they do know that whoever wins this game will have to earn the right to lift that trophy because it's going to be brutal and it's going to be massive. Mm -hmm. uh, so in two years, uh, just under two years now since Razi Erasmus linked up with South Africa and took on the director of rugby role, what, what has he done to kind of mastermind this turnaround in fortunes? Because as we all know, a couple of years ago, when South Africa, we'll remember it here in Ireland, when they came over to Dublin to take on Ireland, they were, they were absolutely terrible. They looked a shadow of their former selves. And two years down the line, they really are looking back to their best. What, what has Razi done in those couple of years to bring them back? I think he's, he's, he's built a trust amongst the players. Uh, he's, he's, he's fortunate and be blessed to have a group, especially forwards, of very talented forwards, big physical men who play the game, huge competition uh, amongst each other to the benefit of the side. Um, 
and I think he's he's stuck to to his guns that he believes that the the, the pattern and, and the, the the game plan he's got now is working for them. And he, and he uh, up to now has proved that you know it's not the most spectacular rugby. And I personally will see South Africa's backs used much more because we have great backs in South Africa, lots of talent there. And I, I think it's a sin if the ball is on the wings as well. And that is big coming from a tough forward. But the fact remains, uh, again, going back to what I said earlier, you know, you play towards your strengths and at this stage it's working for Rossi and he will believe in that and the players will believe in that. So, uh, again, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the other big question is until you come up against a pack that can do that as well as you do, then you will have to have a plan B and there might be concern on that, that specific plan B, what it is. Yeah, and as another uh, texter points out, are England the only side that actually can match South Africa's forwards for physicality? Well, New Zealand can, and, and I think Ireland did well, but, but uh, uh, there's no doubt uh, amongst my mind, uh, in my mind, that South Africa, you know, as a group, probably the top uh, in, uh, in the world on the forward side, and, and, and especially that power coming from the bench. I mean, there are players coming from bench like Marks and Kutsoff uh, and, uh, and these guys that would walk into most other international sides in the world, you know, and they sit on the bench. So that's a great plus to have, uh, that kind of quality depth. But there's no point in having that if you don't use that in the right manner. And at thus far, Rassi has done that. On Razi then as well, we know after the World Cup, he's going to kind of revert back to his director of rugby role. That probably is the next challenge now, regardless of what happens this weekend for South Africa to maintain this. Who would be the contenders to come in as the, as the on-field, as the head coach? Well, there's a couple of names being thrown around. It, this, this sort of announcement from Razi came quite as a surprise to me. I thought he was at least in for an, another couple of years, but uh, obviously he's got other plans. Uh, and I think there's a lot of candidates at this stage. I one, uh, uh, don't know whether they'll probably look outside the borders or whether they're going to stay inside these days. It's nothing strange if uh, a country gets a foreign coach. I mean, that's quite common amongst professional games. So um, I think it's wide open at this stage. I, 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 uh, although the name of a Jacques Nienaber, which you guys know mm. well in Ireland, has been mentioned uh, quite uh, uh uh, quite a lot in, in the media around this couple, last couple of days. So I don't know, to be honest. Uh, it could be interesting. Yeah, and that obviously brings a bit of continuity again as he's a, he's part of Razzie's team. Um, it would be, I suppose, quite poignant as well, given what's happened over the, the last few months in South Africa. Of the 1995 team that you played with, you know, James Small and Chester Williams both, both dying incredibly early in the, you know, incredibly early for South Africa to go on and win a World Cup, I imagine things would be very emotional there as well. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, uh, that's one thing about sport. I think that that is why sport in any sport is so uh, uh, powerful that it evokes emotions from everybody, whether you sit in the stand, whether you participate, whether um, you just watch from a, from a distance. It is an emotional thing. It plays a massive important role. And then I think the, to me as an individual, what I loved about sport is the fact that you make friends for life around the world. Some of my best mates uh, I played against and are from other countries, but that's the beauty of it. So, yes, these two guys, unfortunately, tragically uh, passed away in a very uh, uh, early age. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, they sorely missed and They were great team members. Uh, and, unfortunately, uh, you know, it, uh, that is out of our hands. But uh, for sure, there's no doubt going into another World Cup and a World Cup final, their names will be will be whispered and will be in our hearts and our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, a nice message here. Great to hear from Cobus Visa. What an animal he was back in the day. Come on the spring box. Uh, he didn't give us a name now on this one, but uh, uh, and some nice words for you, Cobus. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Now, I've been, uh, it's, it's the, the rugby family. I think the most important thing is about this game of ours uh, is, is the rugby family around the world. And, I mean, as a player and as a as a as a, a commentator and as a tourist, you know, coming to a country like Ireland, I know uh, how, how passionate you guys are and how hospitable. And you know, I've always felt welcome there. And I think it's a uh, it's uh, uh, you speak to the converted when you speak to the Irish that uh, uh, you don't have to teach you guys about passion. Uh, that's why you guys are so competitive. But uh, great country, great people. And your final prediction then: what, what way is it going to go this Saturday? Well, with my heart, I'm going to give you a score of 21 points to 17 for South Africa. With my head, it might even be closer than that. But I want to call this that South Africa is going to come through as the underdogs here. Um, purely, I think, because they, they pack in the end might be that very small difference needed. All right, Cobus, thanks a million for speaking to us and enjoy the game this Saturday. Anytime, mate. Good talking to you.
So uh, Cobus Visa there, 1995 World Cup winner with South Africa. We're going to go across to uh, Japan now in a moment and speak to um, Alan Quinlan. First, though, we're just going to play a little clip. Uh, Felix Jones, obviously, is going to be involved with the Springboks on Sunday. Here's what Ron Nogara had to say about the former Munster man's role with the team. It'll be a great experience. Um, you know, I don't... Obviously, I think he's uh, a, a consultant with, the, with with South Africa. Obviously, but he's part of the full time staff, so that experience mm. would be would, would be uh, absolutely fascinating for him, and and it's brilliant for him because uh, um, at that age, it's just going to accelerate his development hugely. And um, obviously, Razi has massive amount of faith in him and, and uh, likes his ideas, and uh, and you can only be delighted for him because. Um, it didn't end up well at Munster, and um, one door closes and a bigger door opens, yeah. and he's he's kicking it down, and that's that's uh, that would be his personality. So fair play to him. Have you had much contact with him since you're on? No, I don't, or? because like I, as you say, I didn't realise I'm 42. He's 32, so I was just <laughs> I was kind of I was going out another door when he was coming yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. As a plane, so I had a good few. Uh, Games with him and his attitude was always uh, was always great and uh, is I think he has a very open and growth mindset about him. So um, you forget really how young you, you at thirty two in terms of coaching, but a lot of experience for him. You know, even if he's uh, they had their coaching probably ticket obviously long established, but for them to I suppose uh, take it take him on board at, at a late stage. Um, it speaks volumes for Felix. Yeah, yeah Alan Quinlan there is now uh, in Japan waiting to speak to us. Quinny, I was trying to do the mental maths in my head there. Was there any overlap with your end of your playing career and Felix Jones at Munster, or had you been gone at that stage? No, I played a couple of years with Felix, yeah. and as Rod said, he was, um, he was un unbelievably competitive, uh, knew no other way than 100%, and he uh, was a great teammate, and he was a really positive guy around the group all the time, and worked incredibly hard and I think um, it was disappointing to see him leave, leave Munster and, and to be fair they've you know it's it's probably been a tough transition for for, for that group probably um, you know with with the pressure that's on and the expectation that's in Munster and it, it's a shame that himself and Jerry Jerry left and that they, they couldn't agree agree terms or whatever way you, 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 you want to put it but um, the experience of him going to South Africa and having worked under Rassi I think um, will, it will make him grow as a coach and develop because it's uh, it's another way of doing things, seeing another group of players, the individuals, the way they prepare. Um, and I met him over here. He uh, seemed to have a smile on his face the whole time and, and, and loving it. And um, I think it'd be, it wouldn't it be amazing if we had an Irishman with a World Cup medal next week. Um, we're a good bit away from that as a team yet, but... Uh, I think Felix, what Felix has done, this opportunity is just fantastic for him. Yeah, we'll take whatever success we can get, I think, uh, at this rate, Quinny. Um, as you mentioned, though, it's almost over. We're into the final few days. Saturday, it's all going to be finished. You're into your final few days in Japan. You've been over there, how long now? Five, six weeks? Are you getting a bit homesick? It's six and a half weeks. Um, yeah, I think it's... I don't usually get homesick. I think it's 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 changed obviously since Ireland have been beaten because uh, the first couple of weeks I was really busy doing lots of games in between the Irish games and then kind of looking forward to them. And um, since that's finished, it's kind of changed a little bit. But um, I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's been a brilliant country. It's uh, there's been many highlights. Um, Japan are probably the most positive story. The team themselves, mm. not just the country for hosting it, but unfortunately we fell. We fell to the Japanese, and so did Scotland. I think that 50 minutes against Scotland um, was just amazing. It was so exciting. So uh, it's been a brilliant World Cup, I think. Question marks about some of the games and one-siders and maybe quality of the, some of the games. Um, so it, it, like, there was such a contrast last weekend, wasn't there, in uh, you know, England's performance, and then to watch the game the next day, it was, uh, it was totally different. So there's been a few games that have been probably not easy on the eye a lot of kicking from a lot of teams and uh but it's been a brilliant experience and i think england i i, did, I said they'd win it beforehand and, and it wasn't just saying it for the sake but i thought that i felt that they were going to get it right um they've so much power across right across the board and um, i think they'll probably 
I might disagree with Corbus uh, because I think what he says is is um, is is very relevant. They'll they'll meet a very very powerful aggressive side on Saturday, and I don't think um, they'll be allowed to play as much maybe and dominate the collisions like they did last week. And that that'll be the challenge for South Africa. But will a kicking game be good enough to win you win your World Cup final? I'm not so sure. Yeah, and I think it was one. Um... One of our texters was play, was probably fairly realistic, pointing out that the, if there is one team out there that are capable of matching South Africa's physicality, it probably is England. Yeah, it's um, it's England and New Zealand probably, and um, I think Ireland matched them in the last couple of years. We, our success against South Africa, particularly in Dublin, has been good, and uh, I think one way of matching their physicality is keeping the ball away from them and holding on to it and playing smart rugby, you know. Um, but England can definitely deal with that power, I think. Um, I think they caught, they caught New Zealand on the hop last week and they won a lot of those early collisions and that momentum started to grow for them. So um, will the same thing happen this week? I, I don't know. I think um, it's, it's amazing, Neil, if you know that your opposite number has been a very dominant physical performer it tends to bring more out of you physically to stop him mm. because if you're not on the money 100% against your opposite number, he's going to run out over you. So you get a sense when Billy Vunapola carries, when Etoje carries, when Sinclair carries, Maku Vunapola, that the South Africans will be very, very uh, aware and conscious that they've got to really stop them on the gain line because if England get over the gain line, that's where they're really good. Um, I think four gives him that extra bit of zip at 10. He's a brilliant distributor. And, um, you know, if they can stretch that South African defence, they can cause them all sorts of problems. And they did that to New Zealand last week. Um, if, if England played New Zealand again this week, would it be the same scenario? Probably not, because I think they just, the emotional high New Zealand had against Ireland, maybe they, they, they thought they were in a better place than what they, what they actually were. Um, we did speak about it a lot and um, the vulnerability that this current New Zealand side have had and shown this year. Uh, Australia beat them well in Perth. And, um, so they're not as good as the 2015 side, but it was a brilliant performance by England. But I do think that South Africa won't, will make it quite difficult for them. So it, it'll be interesting to see how they adapt to that. Mm. <clears throat> and how are South Africa going to be going about making it difficult? Is it just spoiling things on the ground, slowing the game down entirely? Um, well, they've got to attack themselves. I think they're not going to go completely away from the kicking game from Faf to Clerk. I think he's kicked 57 times in four or five games that he's played here, which is a huge number for, for a scrum half. And they tend to slow the game down a lot and try and take the sting out of the opposition. That may frustrate England. Um, I think Wales got sucked into that a little bit last week and they started kicking back. And if you kick poorly, well, it's uh, you don't get the return out of it. If you kick accurately, you can, you can it can be a brilliant um, part of your game. So I think South Africa will kick a lot tomorrow or on Saturday, but they've got to kick accurately. And if they can, you know, isolate Watson, um, Elliot Daly and, and Johnny May and get those windows collisions in the air, um, they can get a return on that and they force penalties and they force the opposition to knock the ball on and they want to get the ball into touch and, and, and have their line out and try and get their mall rumbling. That's all well and good, but it's not going to be enough to win the game from. So they've they've got to try and get bring a bit of variety in attack as well. And you think of someone like Chelsea Colby on the wing, you've got to try and get him some ball. I think Dialinde and, and uh, Am in the centre are not really good distributors. Uh, Pollard is a brilliant footballer at 10. And, and if they get a bit of front football in South Africa, they can play a little bit themselves and they can be dangerous off unstructured play. But if, they're, you know, if, they, if they just kick the ball and have one-out runners, they're not going to beat England. So I think they have to add a little bit. Um, they're not going to go away from the kicking game, but they certainly have to add some strategy and attack. Mm -hmm. Does the 6-2 the split, the six forwards and two backs split on the bench, does, does that kind of give you an indication really as to how they're going to be going about this? Like it's it's all about big men, it's about power. You've the likes of like Snyman and Franco Mostert on the bench. Uh, like it's it's all big guys. They're just really just trying to wear down England slowly but surely. 
Yeah, they are, and um, I suppose they've 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 gone with that formula for 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 um, you know throughout this tournament mm. now, and um, it's a lot of power coming off the benches. And Mustard brings a load of energy. He's not the biggest man in the world, but Snaman is huge. Um, so it's uh, it's uh, you know they have Vincent Cock, um, great power coming off the bench. Francois Lowe. So these guys. He wants him to make an impact and really be physical and aggressive. So it's a, it's an absolute sign that they're not going to they're not going to change their game in any way. Um, but they need to add a little bit of, a bit to it um, and hope that um, England can cope with their power. But I think the problem is here: England can cope with their power, and if they do that, well, there's only one winner then. But you know, it depends. It's it's going to be South Africa's. Uh, uh, main goal here in this game is to be put massive pressure on England when they have the ball and try and smash them, unsettle them, play in, the, in, in, in England's half and force penalties and, and hopefully they get their mall going and so a bit of individual brilliance might get them a try or two here but they're not going to be throwing the ball around willy-nilly because I think England's line speed has been very, very impressive under John Mitchell um, and the other key area is the back row, isn't it? Underhill and Curry. Um, how well will, have they played in the last couple of games, the quarter-final, semi-final? They've just been involved in everything. So South Africa have to be very, very conscious and aware of them. Mm -hmm. uh, on Curry, actually, on the back row, there is a text in here uh, to put to you. What is it, Quinny, that makes Tom Curry such an effective player for England? I think it's a hard one to kind of pick one thing out. But if you, if you look at... He's an exceptional freak in nature, if you like, because... He made his debut at 18 in the Premiership, mm -hmm. um, which is it tells its own story. For somebody to be able to do that, they have to be a real special talent. But particularly in the back row, you've got to be physically mature and strong, um, hard as well and abrasive. And I just think he his all round game is just magnificent. And for him to transition over from seven to six and and get all the set piece right stuff right. Uh, particularly around the lineout, and he's he was an option in the lineout last week, and again Aust against Australia as well. So he's obviously a very intelligent player. But as regards an athlete, he's just incredibly powerful, durable, quick, uh, and and a good ball player. So I've said this uh, in the last week or so. I th I think he's the complete package. He's 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 a quicker version and a better version of of Richie McCaw, I think. And the challenges for him now as a young player is to maintain that that standard like McCall did for probably 14 years which was remarkable um, I think Curry is, is 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 a really really exceptional player Yeah and I suppose the, the hope and maybe the only real worry with him is he's played so much rugby at such a young age that maybe you know in 6-7 years time you hope that his body is kind of able to cope with it all Yeah he's not going to be, be able to keep keep maintaining um, international rugby, premiership rugby, long season every year without picking up bangs and knocks and injuries. Um, and it's how he's managed as well. Um, I think Richie McCaw had, in his career, had a number of kind of <clears throat> periods off, which um, even though when you get injured, you think, you think it's a disaster, but it adds a little bit on at the end of your career because you can get a break and you can rehab and, and strengthen other parts of your body. McCaw had a lot of time out with injuries or in the early, earlier part of his career. Um, and then he had a sabbatical and stuff like that and, and was managed very well when he got older. So that's just going to be the case with all modern-day rugby players, Neil. You, you just can't maintain international rugby, club rugby, mm. um, European rugby and play every game. It's just not feasible. But I think he's very, very durable. And he's... Uh, you know, to have a kid like that playing it so well and so dominant at 21, it just doesn't seem that anything phases him. Trains incredibly hard, and uh, he's just a special talent. And Underhill as well, and he's been a real find for him because they complement each other and they hunt and they they hunt in packs, if you like, you know. And uh, and they've actually taken a little bit of they've taken pressure off Vinnie Gunapolo because. I think in the last couple of years there was a lot of talk when Billy Billy Bunapola didn't play and he's an he's an exceptional player that England really struggled in the back row. I think they could cope better now without Billy Bunapola because these two guys are offering themselves up to carry the ball as well. 
um, and they're very, very good footballers. So it's uh, it's it's a brilliant balance of that back row, and I think that's going to be a real key area tomorrow. And it'll be interesting to see our, on Saturday how Step the Toy, uh, Vermeule, and, and Khaleesi perform. They've got to find their their A games to go up against that English back row. Yeah, and on that as well, like I mean, how much of a role is Jerome Garcia is going to have in this because he hasn't been the most popular choice ever for a final. I think the concern is it's not so much how you know the penalties he's giving the penalties he's giving or how much he's blowing the whistle, it's how little he's actually blowing the whistle. There's always kind of accusations maybe there's a lot of non refereeing going on with him. It's a bit of a free for all. Yeah, the breakdown can be. I think he's a very good referee in, in, in overall, but I think the one weakness his one weakness is is around the breakdown. And, um, you know, there can be a lot of stuff going on there, side entries, guys off their feet. Um, guys sh um, potentially should be getting rewarded when they get their hands on, and, and it's a bit of a dogfight at times. So it's it's an area that is a very important in any game. But I think for this game, I think it's the area that's going to decide the game because um, I just thought that the way they frustrated New Zealand last week um, and the way they defended as well, because their defence was very, very good. Their hunt, um, the way they numbered up, and the way they they stayed connected to each other in defence, and the line speed just it really just drove uh, drove the the New Zealand players mad. I think Aaron Smith was flapping his hands all the time, and every time Moonga got the ball, there was three English guys in front of him. They were just getting off the line so well. Um, so Gar says it's crucial in that area, and if, if South Africa can generate a bit of quick ball, and and they get even if it's the one out runner scenario, um, if they you know they're very very hard to stop because they're big men and they're very powerful and they're good good ball players. So um, it's a real real crucial area, and I hope he gets it right because I think he deserves the final. But that is the one area that's that's probably the hottest topic is the breakdown for the weekend, and it's not his hottest or best best attribute as a referee. So um, I'm sure he'll be aware of that. I'm sure he'll, he'll be conscious of the fact that he's got to get that area right. One final question before I get some predictions off here for this weekend. Uh, this is from Phil in Ross Gray. How does the English team compare to the 2003 one in terms of arrogance and cockiness? Um, well, to be honest, I, do, I don't think they're arrogant and cocky. Yeah, I'd be the uh, same. As much, I think they're a lot more likeable than previous teams. Yeah, as much as we'd like to have a chip on the shoulder as Irish people and say we don't like them because they're arrogant and they're cocky and that, um, uh, it's not. I don't think it's the case. I think they've been. You look at someone like Owen Farrell. I think he's very humble. Um, he's a really good captain and 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 your captain and leader kind of sets the tone for the rest of the team. Um, I think they're incredible incredible competitors. Um, I think you know you'll always have a situation where in any team that. Some guys maybe think they're better than they're better than others, or or they get ahead of themselves, and that's up to the captain and the leaders to kind of to keep it uh, keep a lid on that stuff. I think um, obviously Martin Johnson, who was an incredible leader and a uh, very down to earth fella, um, didn't never got ahead of himself, didn't like the flashy stuff. He he kept that 2003 team um, with their feet on the ground, and I think they were quite a humble bunch. And I played against them and. I'm good friends with lots of those guys now, and uh, so I, I think it's a bit of a myth if if you're if 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 if, if people think that this team are arrogant. I think um, Farrell kind of epitomises it: hard work, commitment. Um, look, I think they they'll always feel that they're better than than most teams, and that can be a good attribute as mm. well because England should be. The reality here, Neil, is England should be competing for World Cup finals, semi-finals every single time, given the player pool that they have, given the strength of the Premiership, the amount of numbers they have to pick from, given the financial situation, even though they are in in the red at the moment, I think, but every resource has been given to Eddie Jones to prepare his team for this World Cup, probably. Um, so they should be in that position every time. So. I don't think they're arrogant. I think their their feet are pretty much on the ground, to be honest, and uh, and and that's why. Um, and and what I meant to say, the 2011 group, Martin Johnson had problems with them at the World Cup, mm. didn't he? Uh, um, you know, getting ahead of themselves, behaviours off the field, all that kind of stuff. Stuart Lancaster tried to change that whole whole scenario with players and and the perception of the group and and tried to make them humble. So. 
I um, I think it's an important part of, of they'll always have a confidence about them, any English teams you play, but I think there's a difference between confidence and arrogance. And finally then, predictions for this weekend. We'll start with tomorrow morning, uh, the third, fourth place playoff. Hard to see past New Zealand beating Wales. And then Saturday, what's your call? Yeah, it is hard to see past um, New Zealand and Wales. And I think you know, Wales have had so many bloody injuries now. They've been very, very unlucky. And, and, I, and I really think that they could have won that game last week if they didn't get sucked in a little bit to the to that kicking game. And, and um, you know, it was one of those ones where I think they regretted afterwards that maybe they, they didn't play a little bit more. Um, so I think it'll be very difficult for them to pick themselves up again. New Zealand never really lose two games in a trot, do they? So I no. think they're going to meet a, a very determined, uh, angry New Zealand side. So it should be a good game. They're always decent games, the third and fourth place playoff, because teams throw the wrong take chances. So I think New Zealand will be too strong for that one. But um, it doesn't really matter who wins or loses it, really. It's not Yeah. It's not something that people will be judged on afterwards. Um, I think... Uh, Regarding the final, I, I I have a feeling that South Africa could really give them a scare. And I think that's a real, real probability. Um, I just think that England have come too far and they've played so well for for so long. Sometimes you, you, you get a bad performance out of nowhere, but I just think they're in a perfect position now. They've had an extra day's recovery um, and I just think they're too good. Um, I think the variety in their game um, they kicked the ball 32 times last week, so they do kick a fair bit themselves, and they will do on Saturday because they like to play territory a, a lot. Um, but if they if they can, and I think they will be able to cope with that that power and that that pressure that South Africa put under them. I think they'll be just too good. Um, but they've got to execute and they've got to really go for it and play. Their canvas under pressure last week was brilliant, and they've got to do it again this week. So I think England by six eight points. Quinny, thanks a million for joining us this afternoon and enjoy the uh, enjoy the finals weekend. Pleasure. Thanks, Neil. Alan Quinlan there speaking to us from Japan ahead of the third place playoff and World Cup final this weekend. That's all we have time for this afternoon on our uh, Rugby World Cup show. Just a few more texts to, before we finish off. Quite a few coming in from South Africa, or at least from South African people uh, this afternoon. Mon the Bach, says uh, Pienaar van Vijk. Uh, Peter says Razzie has done a great job with the Springbok team and we hope he can lead us to a third Webb Ellis uh, Evan says lads England are far too strong and showed that against the All Blacks England to win by nine or more um, another South African message Leon Van Royen says as a South African obviously I want us to win and to beat the Palms would make it even better England have shot their shot against the All Blacks the box have not had their best game yet Dermot O'Riordan says, if the England of last week turn up, I can't see South Africa beating them. I think that's a general consensus of a lot of people, Dermot. Another texter says, Faf is the man, Faf de Clerk. He will have a big say in this game, mark my words. Uh, a message from Shea going, a nightmare World Cup as far as Irish fans are concerned. Stop talking about Ireland, Shea. Stop talking about Ireland. But if Eddie Jones leads England to a World Cup success, I don't think I'll be able to watch rugby or listen to anything rugby related again. On the box. Uh, don't be so down on yourself, Shay. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to like about this England team, as Alan Quinlan pointed out. Ruin Schumann, South Africa is a, dist a different beast to New Zealand. And the final message from Jeff: the chariot will be bringing Webb back home, boys. England have been the best team in this tournament. The current squad could go on to do All Black things. Uh, God, imagine another period of dominance like we've seen from the All Blacks this time from England. Uh, poor Shea wouldn't be able to uh, wouldn't be able to deal with it. Uh, as I say, that's all we have time for on this uh, this Thursday's Rugby World Cup show. We'll be back for one final instalment next week. Keep an eye out though on Off the Ball and across all our social channels and on OTB Sports Radio and the GoLad app because we're going to have tons more rugby coverage over the next few days. And also keep an eye out on Twitter, at Off the Ball as well this evening, because we might just have another Richard's rugger thing. Uh, Rumours circulating this afternoon that Bod Rodge and even Will Greenwood are making an appearance. We'll speak to you soon. OTB Gold, the very best of Off the Ball. Are you crazy? This is OTB Sports Radio. This week on OTB Gold. Absolutely brilliant manoeuvre by Matt Fantastically brave. Oh, yeah. It, it's been a hell of a, 
A life and a career, yeah. Thank you for giving me this platform to announce my retirement. Remember the World Cup being very little fun. Westman lead 2-13 to 2-8. Honestly, I thought it was just uh, great to get